All right, let's get started with our online lecture. So what did we cover on Friday? So we ended our um, fatty acid chapter, a synthesis chapter at least. Um, so here, the first thing we talked about is that long fatty acids can be uh, broken down the peroxisome. Uh, the difference is you make hydrogen peroxide, NADH needs to be exported out, and your acetylcholine A needs to be exported out because peroxisome does not have your oxidative phosphorylation enzymes. We also talked about ketone bodies. If we have glucagon, if we're low in glucose, then and your liver is out of its own supply, it will start to break down fatty acids and send out these ketone bodies. So the three ketone bodies are acetone, acetoacetate, D-beta hydroxybutyrate. Uh, acetone, not really useful, um, but acetoacetate and D-beta hydroxybutyrate are. So every tissue can use these except the liver. So what's actually happening during these situations are Actually, let's talk about what how we make these. So fatty acid, since it's breaking down in the liver, makes acetylcoenzyme A. Acetylcoenzyme A turns into acetoacylcoenzyme A, which will eventually become acetoacetate. So the big thing here, to make one ketone body, you need three acetylcoenzyme A. Acetoacetate can be turned into D-beta hydroxybutyrate that, call, that uses one NADH. When we talked about the logic of that, right? If the liver is breaking down fatty acids, has a lot of acetylcholine A, it's doing a lot of the Krebs cycle, the citric acid cycle. The citric acid cycle will stop if you have too much NADH. So you can use that NADH to make a different ketone body and keep the process going. All right, and then we looked at... Um, what else is going on in the liver, right? We just said that um, we are doing the citric acid cycle in the liver because the brain actually can't use ketone bodies either. So your liver will be doing the citric acid cycle to make oxaloacetate. That oxaloacetate via gluconeogenesis can be made into glucose. That glucose can go to your brain. We talked about some of the negatives about ketone bodies. Um, you can get ketoacidosis. That is, if you have ex excess ketone bodies, you will start having uh, ketones in your blood and urine. That's ketosis. And these ketone bodies will drop the pH of your blood. That is ketoacidosis. With that, that is the fatty acid chapter. And now we are going to move on to chapter 18. And we're going to do just a brief look at chapter 18. So we're going to do 18.1. And that is the metabolic fates of amino groups. All right. So your amino acids have an H3 group, if you remember. And when we break down that uh, amino acids, when we break down protein, one of the molecules that we'll make is NH4 plus ammonia. Now this is toxic to us. We need to get rid of this ammonia some way. Now, if you're an aquatic vertebrae, you can actually just flush this out of your system since you're just surrounded by water. Um, us, we need a molecule called urea. So these are terrestrial vertebrae, or vertebrates rather. Also, sharks do this. I don't know why, but they do. We will make urea, right? H2N, C, N, H2, double bond O, where our ammonia will be uh, connected to this carbonyl. If you are a bird or a reptile, you will get rid of your ammonia by making uric acid. Which is a ring structure. It's 
draw it out here. And here we have one, two, three, four nitrogens we are getting rid of. So aquatic vertebrates, just remove the ammonia. Terrestrial vertebrates, we remove two ammonias at the same time doing urea. And then birds or reptiles will get rid of four, making uric acid, right? And let's kind of just look at the flow chart for what is going on here and with our urea. So, so big picture. For this process. So we have three ways we can um, use our three sources of protein, basically. Three sources of protein that the body can use from energy. Source one is ingested. Oops, ingested protein. So this is the protein you eat, right? And so you eat it and you'll break it down into amino acids. So I'll just draw your generic amino acid. Here's our ammonia. So our we're going to be paying attention to our nitrogen groups for this section. Now, this ammonia, you can make that into, you know, protein, if, or rather not the ammonia, but the amino acid. You can make that into proteins if you want. Um, you can make that into glutamate. And if you make this into glutamate, that is the nitrogen, the nitrogen can go over to an amino acid and make glutamate. You'll be left over with an alpha keto acid. So I'm just gonna draw alpha keto acid over here. But what's an alpha keto acid? An alpha keto acid is an amino acid that has lost its nitrogen. Right, so if we have an ingested protein, what you can do is that you can give that nitrogen to, um, and what, what you're actually giving it to, I'll, I'll add that in, is alpha keto glutarate. So alpha ketoglutarate, remember, was from the citric acid cycle. I'll draw it here so we can take a look at it. And now we can know why it's called alpha ketoglutarate, right? So you can see this is an amino acid. However, there is no nitrogen. And so If we give that nitrogen of our amino acid, so here we are giving nitrogen to alpha ketoglutarate. Actually, let me rewrite that. That was kind of sloppy. So we give our, we eat protein, we give our nitrogen to alpha ketoglutarate, and we are left over with an alpha keto acid. That alpha ketoglutarate then becomes glutamate. And again, I apologize. I am writing very poorly here. Glutamate. Writing on my computer at home has a different feel than my laptop. I don't know why, but it does. Keto acid. And our glutamate is our AKG with that nitrogen on it. Right, so keep that in mind. If we, and we'll see this more in depth, but when we eat a protein, it breaks down amino acids. If we want to digest that protein, we need to get rid of this urea. So we give it to alpha ketoglutarate and it becomes glutamate and we're left over with a, a um, alpha keto acid. That glutamate, we can remove the NH4 plus. It would wreak become alpha ketoglutarate there. And that NH4 plus, we will send to the urea cycle. 
right? So what we're going to see in this chapter is glutamate is going to be our main player. So that's one source was ingestion of protein. Let's let's take a look at a, another source. Source two is that you can get um, glutamine from muscles slash tissues. So you can break down your glutamine. So let's take a look at what glutamine looks like. This is a good refresher for you who have forgotten your amino acids. CH2, CH2, C double bond O, NH2. All right, here, the difference between glutamate, or sorry, glutamine, and glutamate is this nitrogen at the last carbon. So if we remove this nitrogen, it becomes NH4, and then our glutamine becomes glutamate, right? So if we get glutamine from tissues, we just remove the nitrogen and it becomes glutamate, that NH4 can go to the urea cycle. The last source of um, amino acids is that we can get, and I'm gonna remove this alpha keto now. We can get alanine from muscles. The alanine COO minus carbon. And there's our NH3 group on the side. So here, it's a little bit complex when you first look at it. But we're going to take alpha ketoglutarate. We are going to combine it to our alanine. And we are going to make pyruvate. And what we're going to be left over with is, if you can guess it, it is glutamate. All right, so what just happened in that reaction? Basically, basically, you take this nitrogen, you stick it on alpha ketoglutarate to become glutamate, you do some other chemistry, though. Uh, again, this is just a big overview. And your alpha carbon, remember this is the alpha carbon, becomes a carbonyl group, and you make pyruvate. All right, so three sources here. If you eat proteins, right, you can either use them as cellular protein. Let me, looks like the cellular got it away there. Or you can start to digest them. If you digest them, you get the nitrogen to glutamate or sorry, you give the nitrogen to alpha ketoglutarate to make glutamate, you become an alpha keto acid. That glutamate loses its NH4 to re-become alpha ketoglutarate and make urea. If you get glutamine from muscles, glutamine and glutamate, the only difference is this NH2 group. So you give, or you chop off the NH2 group to make NH4, and you become glutamate again. If you have alanine from muscles, you can just give your nitrogen to alpha ketoglutarate. That alpha ketoglutarate becomes glutamate, and you continue the same process, and your alanine becomes pyruvate. So that's that's the big picture here, and we're going to kind of jump into some of these processes. And so the first thing we're going to look at is that dietary protein. So we're going to look at how we digest proteins. And so we're going to look at a lot of hormones here. I don't know, a lot, just a couple, actually. 
And so the first hormone is gastrin. And, and so gastrin released when protein is in the stomach. And what gastrin does is that it increases the concentration of HCL and this enzyme called pepsogenesin, pe pepsinogen, excuse me, pepsinogen in the stomach, right? So you eat um, protein, hit your stomach, you release gastrin, gastrin then increases the amount of acid in your stomach and the amount of this enzyme pepsinogen. So what does pepsinogen do? So let's look at pepsinogen. So pepsinogen is an enzyme. And technically, actually, it's a zymogen. And we talked about zymogens back in biochemistry one, but here is a refresher. Let's use this nice pink. Thymogen. It's like a precursor to an enzyme. Or another way I could say it is it's an inactivated enzyme. It's not quite that. Um, it just hasn't been activated yet, I suppose. Right? But a zymogen is a a protein that will become an enzyme once it's been modified to do it. And so this will activate and become pepsin at low pH. Right, so pepsinogen is released into the stomach. The stomach is low pH, and that's when it becomes pepsin. And what pepsin does is an enzyme that cleaves proteins into amino acids. So it makes sense that if we have this in our body, we want to have an inactivated virgin, version, rather. Right? Um, because if we had pepsin in our cells, it would just eat us alive. So we want to make sure you, you only turn on in the stomach. Right. So let's let's look at this flow chart for the, all these steps. Let's just line it up. So protein goes into the stomach. Right, and so what will happen then is that um, gastrin will release in the stomach. When gastrin releases in the stomach, the amount of HCL and pepsinogen increases this pepsinogen becomes pepsin because pH is low. This pepsin cleaves the protein you just, just ate. All right, so that's kind of like the flow chart of everything we just talked about. Um, there's actually one other thing that, that happens here is uh, there's another hormone called secretin. So let's say that um, you have low pH in your small intestine, right? Because, you know, your stomach's full of acid. So it's possible that acid kind of goes out and goes in your small intestine. This would be bad because we don't want very acidic things in our small intestine. So what does secretin do? It tells the pancreas 
to secrete bicarbonate. Bicarbonate is a base, so it'll neutralize your HCl. This is kind of like a, um, so secrete, I didn't write that down, but that's a hormone. Hormone release when the pH is low in your small intestine, right? And we, so the pancreas is told, okay, if this, this um, hormone is around, that means you need to release bicarbonate um, to, to neutralize LHCL. And as you can see, the pancreas is important for this. So in digestion, we need our pancreas. And you can actually get acute pancreatitis. I'm sure you have probably heard of pancreatitis before. So what is pancreatitis? So the pancreas, if we just kind of uh, look at it, the whoops, pancreas releases into the small intestine. So acute pancreatitis, uh, pancreatitis is when your uh, pancreas is blocked from secreting. So why is this bad? Well, one of the bad things would happen is that those zymogens we just talked about, they would uh, convert into their enzymes, their real enzymes. So convert into active form in the pancreas. All right, so your um, enzymatic enzymes will start eating you from the inside out. And that's why acute pancreatitis, is, I assume, is extremely painful. At least from all the movies I've seen, it looks very painful. All right. So that's kind of like the big picture of you know what's happening here. Now let's talk about ammonia now. Right? Remember ammonia. is toxic. So we just don't want it floating around. So as we saw in our overview, glutamine is the amino acid uh, is responsible for transporting um, this in the bloodstream. So let's take a look at how we are going to uh, create this glutamine, right? So we're going to start with glutamate. And let's just draw our glutamate. I know it's been a while since Biochem 1. You've probably forgotten your amino acids. So that's fun. The first thing that we're gonna have is glutamine synthase. That's our enzyme. Nice that it's telling you what it's doing. It's synth and synthesizing glutamine. This create this needs ATP. So we the first step to make glutamine, we need to use ATP because we are gonna add a phosphate group to our glutamate. Remember, phosphates are excellent leaving groups. And our whole idea here is to add nitrogen to our molecule. So let me just redraw this. Right, so we want to add ammonia eventually. So this phosphate will be our leaving group for that. So that's the first thing glutamine synthesis does. And then in the second part of the reaction, same enzyme, glutamine synthase,
We'll take that free ammonia that we were just talking about as we're breaking down the amino acids in our stomach. And we will remove the phosphate, again, leaving group. And we'll make that glutamine. So at the very beginning of this lecture, I talked about glutamine for muscles, right? This is a possible way you can make it. So now we have glutamine. And then eventually we want to remove this nitrogen. So there's an enzyme called glutamase. All right, gluta. Glutaminase, I guess, is how we pronounce that, glutaminase. And this is in the liver, in the mitochondria. Again, we are talking about um, metabolism, so it's not surprising the liver shows up. The liver is the superhero of metabolism. And here, we are going to remove that NH2, so we are going to remake our glutamine. So we're going to remake that glutamine, or sorry, glutamate. Now I'm getting the things confused. We're going to remake our glutamate. Water is going to come in and remove that NH4 group. And as we're going to see, this will turn into urea. So just the flow chart again, you know, how to transport uh, ammonia throughout the bloodstream. Um, well, gluta, glutamine could do that. And what you do is you take your glutamate, you take an ATP, put a phosphate at the end of glutamate, that's glutamine synthase, step one. Step two, glutamine synthase. We wanna take that ammonia group, again, toxic. So we're gonna remove the phosphate, what we just added, because again, phosphate's a good leaving group. Stick it right there. Now we have glutamine. Glutamine is going to travel to the liver. And then in the liver, once it gets in the mitochondria, glutaminase is going to remove that NH4, chop it off, and we can safely turn that into urea. And we'll be left over for glutamate. All right. So if we just go back, we briefly talked about the three sources of protein, ingested protein, glutamine for muscle tissues. But let's talk about the last way that um, you know we have to worry about ammonia, and that's alanine for muscles. So let's talk about the glucose alanine cycle. So we're going to start at your muscle. And we have talked about already glucose will become pyruvate. Seems like so long ago we talked about this glucose pyruvate via glycolysis. Now that pyruvate can eventually become alanine. How? Well, if we have our muscle protein and we break this down, we break it down into amino acids. From those amino acids, we're going to remove the NH4 plus. Right? Remember, when we do that, we make alpha keto acids. And this NH4 plus will be used to make glutamate. This glutamate will be part of this process. So we're going to give the nitrogen to the pyruvate to make alum, right? Which is what we're showing here, but kind of like in reverse, pyruvate alanine. Here, we're making the alanine from the pyruvate. And so when glutamate loses its nitrogen, it becomes alpha keto 
glutarate. Again, alpha keto, because it's an alpha keto amino acid. The enzyme that is responsible for this is called alanine, alanine amino transferase. Right? It's very nicely named alanine amino transferase. I'm giving an amino group to alanine. So this alanine will travel in the blood. So it'll become blood alanine. So in your bloodstream, you'll have this alanine. Until it goes to your liver. And so the reverse will just happen to your liver. Your liver will take that alanine and remake pyruvate. And so it's going to be the reverse of what just happened in your muscle. We're going to take an alpha keto glutarate. We're going to stick the NH4 on there. And you'll make glutamate. And again, it's the same enzyme that does this. Alanine, amino, oops, getting ahead of myself with the letter M. Alanine amino transferase. That glutamate will remove its NH4 plus to re become alpha ketoglutarate. And then eventually that will become urea via the urea cycle. However, this pyruvate is in the liver, still have energy. So we can use gluconeogenesis. to make that into glucose. That glucose will travel through your blood, so it'll become blood glucose. Until it goes back to your muscle for glucose. And that is the glucose alanine cycle. So let's just uh, recap that. Your muscle, you're doing glycolysis, you'll make pyruvate. When you break down protein in your muscle, you're going to make glutamate. That, that, um, that NH4 group will eventually go to glutamate. Excuse me. You're going to take that NH4, give it to pyruvate to make alanine. By alanine amino transferase, you'll make alpha ketoglutarate. That alanine will travel to your liver you'll do the reverse. You take that alpha ketoglutarate, we'll get an ammonia, and becomes glutamate. Again, alanine amino transferase. That glutamate will get rid of its NH4 group through the urea cycle. And when the alanine lost its ammonia, it became pyruvate again. Well, pyruvate, we want to send back to the muscles. So we're going to turn it back into glucose using gluconeogenesis, send that to blood, and then go back to the muscles. All right, um, the next thing we have is the urea cycle. But I think I'm actually going to pause on that because it's quite it's quite involved. So um, I think that'll be good for us to be in person um, so we can talk about that together. But as always, if you have questions about um, what's going on here, uh, let me know. Otherwise, I hope you have enjoyed or will enjoy the eclipse today. Uh, see everybody on Wednesday.